So a big welcome to Ennerdale uh, in the quiet corner of um, the Lake District National Park. So I'm Rachel Oakley and I'm the Partnership Officer for Wild Ennerdale. And I'm Gareth Banning, I'm the Area Forester with Forestry England and a partner in Wild Ennerdale for this valley. So we've got a beautiful day here in the valley and we're nestled on the quieter side um, of West Cumbria within the National Park. Um, the lovely valley is the backdrop here and we're not far also from coastal communities uh, in West Cumbria. Beyond that is the Irish Sea with nice views out to the Isle of Man on a clear day and also we're not far from the Scottish border up in Dumfries and Galloway. So we've got a lovely opportunity to share some of the experiences um, for the last kind of two decades of working on, on this project and we'll showcase uh, some of the sites uh, around the valley. So just a little bit about Wild Ennerdale. Uh, so around 20 years ago now, four partners came together uh, to discuss managing the whole valley uh, in a different way. So it's very much about a landscape scale approach. And those discussions uh, led to Wild Ennerdale um, developing and our vision is to favour natural processes and this very much steers our decision making and the practical delivery in the valley. So we've gone from very much a kind of fragmented uh, piecemeal approach to looking after this special place to a much more um, holistic landscape scale uh, ambition if you like. Uh, so those partners involved um, we've got a combination of a charity so the National Trust just shy of um, six million members and we have United Utilities, so that's the water company for this region who look after uh, the lake, so that's Ennerdale Water. Now it's a non-owned catchment, so it's important to have um, the water company involved. It gives them a much um, kind of greater steer on what happens within the catchment and that's obviously important for uh, water quality into the lake. We also have Forestry England, so they are the biggest landowner uh, in the valley and Forestry England um, came into being, if you like, in the valley in the early um, 1920s, uh, post First World War when there's a big increase in demand for, for timber as a nation. So that significantly changed the look and feel of, of the valley and that's influenced kind of where we are today with Wild Ennerdale and our approach to thinking about woodland and forestry. And then the fourth partner is Natural England. So a government, government organisation, and they have a, a key advisory and supporting role. Very much of this landscape is, is designated for special qualities, so it's really important to have their, their steer on thinking about future management for the valley. So it's landscape scale, just under 5,000 hectares in total. And so practical delivery and also the mindsets of the partnership are very much about thinking collaboratively, thinking as one team. Uh, and we can you know, see that in the way that the valley is being, evolving into the future. As a partnership over the last two decades, we've um, come together and shared resources to uh, kind of broaden our understanding of people in the landscape and that ebb and flow of human activity. So not just focusing on kind of the last century or a couple of centuries, but the last three plus millennia, when we know that cycles of, of people and settlement have come and gone in this valley and that more of a broadened understanding of that relationship with the land. Um, so we just stood up here in the middle valley at a place called Smithy Beck um, and just behind me is what's known as a double walled longhouse. There's a series of four in a line here. So a medieval settlement and very much connected with uh, a bloomery site down by the lake. And we, through working with archaeologists, we know we have over 500 uh, individually listed archaeological features in the valley. So that in itself is, is something to, to celebrate. And we share the knowledge and understanding of that through our website and focusing on individual features. Also within those features, we have uh, scheduled ancient monuments. Uh, and obviously that comes under our care across, across the partnership area. As a partnership, we're really focused on natural process and releasing them across the valley. This is a really good example where there used to be a concrete pipe bridge that was blocking the natural processes of this river, taking gravels downstream onto the Arctic Char spawning beds just down near the lake. In 2010, levels of fish spawning were down to just a handful of fish and working with the Environment Agency, 
identified this bridge needed to come out to let more gravel downstream for them to lay their eggs in. So we replaced it with a footbridge and within a couple of years the char spawning increased. So now we have 500, 600 adults each year and the environment agents have said they're no longer under threat of extinction which is really good. So this is the River Liza and in Old Norse language means shining and I think on a day like today you can really see its natural beauty. It's, uh, it's a key feature of the valley and it's absolutely beautiful. Its source starts at the valley head up around Great Gable and it flows through the upper and middle valley for around about six or seven miles until it reaches Ennerdale Water. My name is John Gorst, I'm the Catchment Partnership Officer for United Utilities in Cumbria and I represent the company on the Wild Ennerdale Partnership. The River Liza responds uh, very differently to most other rivers in the county. Um, when, it, when we have severe rainfall events, rather than becoming a raging uh, torrent destroying things downstream, bridges and, and, and other things, it actually spreads out across the floodplain and, and whilst there are millions of litres of water passing through the system, it all flows fairly slowly and because it's running through uh, dense vegetation in some areas, uh, it, that slows it down even more and then by slowing down it drops out a lot of its um, bed load, a lot of the sediments and silts that have been eroded higher up the channel. And that's really important for lots of reasons, not just for water quality, but also for, for biodiversity in general. It creates all sorts of niches for things, for vegetation to establish. It benefits the fish because the river is dynamic and has deeper pools and shallow riffle beds and all of the sort of features that uh, the fish require for their life cycles. There's plenty of woody debris in the channel for them to hide from predators. And so it functions in a, in a proper way. And, and I suppose as a partnership, we've come to realize the, the importance of that functioning as part of the Wild Ennerdale story. Um, dynamic rivers give us a huge amount. So behind us are our wonderful herd of Galloway cows. So back in 2006, we took the decision as a, as a team to introduce cattle, to bring in a different type of dynamic disturbance to the valley, in addition to sheep grazing. Um, so they bring, they bring a, a disturbance within kind of traditionally grazed fields, but also importantly within the forest now as well. So we're starting to blur those boundaries between farmland and forest. And that in itself has created new business opportunity for the local farmer. So the cattle graze very extensively in low numbers across around a thousand hectares of land from this middle valley here right up to the, the valley head below Great Gable. So their impacts because of the weight of them, uh, they're breaking up the ground and the grass sward more so they're allowing more natural regeneration to happen and over the last 15 years we've seen a huge kind of boost in the floral diversity within this landscape so a real kind of learning process for us as a team and for the farmer involved as well. So since the cattle arrived back in 2007 we've been doing some bird monitoring with our local ornithologist and we've recorded some significant increases in terms of nature recovery. So 25% increase in bird species and a 65% increase in bird numbers specific to this Gillithwaite area which is fantastic news. The forests of Ennerdale are very diverse. They extend around 600, 700 hectares across the valley and range from ancient semi-natural woodland right through to native uh, species such as pine and then non-native species, typically sicker spruce, but also western hemlock and cedar. Behind me is a, a conifer forest that's just been thinned and you can start to see some of the diversity of structure with regeneration and gaps and glades that we're hoping the forest will develop into. One of the big challenges we have in Ennerdale with our big forest is Phytophthora morum, which is a disease of larch. And larch is a big component of the valley because it's like a broadleaf, it loses its needles in autumn and changes colour. Looks fantastic. But unfortunately this disease is attacking our larch trees, not just here but across uh, the England and in other parts of the uh, UK as well. And we're having to fell those trees to try and reduce the sporulation so the disease doesn't spread or jump into another species such as oak. And that means we're not in control of what happens in the valley. We just have to fell whatever gets infected. But 
There is an opportunity then for us to change the species to plant native trees like Scots and Birch and hopefully in the future our future uh, successors will see a different woodland to what we see today. As part of our focus on natural processes we're moving further and further towards relying on natural regeneration where the seed source is there. However at the east end of the valley the only seed source is Sitka spruce which is very dominant in the valley so we are having to plant uh, native trees like birch, oak, juniper, willow, rarin and we the plan is really that they are the future seed source for the future woodland not the woodland itself they are the seed source for the future woodland. Ennerdale's forest bring it a character that's not typical of most Lake District valleys. In fact many people will say it feels a bit like Canada or Scotland. These tall conifers and the mix of species in and around them and the rockies, crags and mountains just have a different feel about them, a wild remote feel that adds to the sense of place and sense of wildness of this valley. As we head up to the top of the valley, heading east, you notice that the forest is dominated by Sitka spruce. There's not many other species. The seeds haven't blown west from the west east far enough to, to regenerate this area yet. We're doing a number of things here. The main change we're making is removing non-native conifer from the valley bottom, from the riparian woodland zone, allowing that to regenerate, planting some species that don't regenerate, so we get better, more open native woodland which our cattle can roam through and which connects the valley from mountain right through to the lake at the west end. This will take a couple of decades but already we can see the benefits in areas that were done in the late 1990s. We're here at Moss Dub Tarn which is a lovely tranquil place in the middle of the valley. Water body surrounded by woodland and it's here that we hope to reintroduce beaver at some point in the future. We've had an ecology feasibility study done which says that beaver would be suitable and we're now in a phase of just starting the public engagement and discussion. If we go forward it'd be really great to see how beavers change the aquatic environment in the same way that cattle are having an impact on the terrestrial environment. We think they'll really bring in more wetland and store more water here and the wetland will bring more insects and bird life which will kickstart the bottom of the food chain. So it's a really exciting opportunity that we're looking forward to over the next couple of years. We haven't said much about the valley's mountains behind me, but they are absolutely an important part of Wild Ennerdale. They protect the landscape, they enclose it so you can't see out into busier places and into urban areas. They give it height and altitude which bring new habitats. And they create drama that gives us that sense of wildness that's important for, and they also provide a level of tranquility. We're doing things up on the mountains as well as down here in the valley, but it's more difficult to get there. But we are looking after some subalpine meadows and we're trying to exclude uh, sheep grazing from these areas by re-erecting an old wall, a stone wall along the ridge line at about 3,000 feet above sea level. It's a challenging area because it's very big, it's very remote, it takes a long time to get to. We're looking at expanding the woodlands in Ennerdale Currently they cover about 18% of the valley, but mostly in the valley bottom and some of the valley sides. We'd like to see them grow out and over parts of the valley's mountains. Different woodlands, scrub, montane woodland, open, clumpy, birch, rowan, juniper, willow. But nonetheless very important for uh, birds, invertebrates and animals. Over the next 50 years or so we hope that we might see the woodland cover in the valley expand to around 40% of the valley, which would be a real, real achievement. Around the valley we thought we'd share with you some of the challenges we faced and, and some of the ways we're trying to handle those challenges. So when we started out kind of 20 years ago with Wild Ennerdale, we knew that people were 
absolutely crucial to the vision and that's well embedded so it's not kind of a purist ecological approach it's very much about people too uh, and a key element of that is working with the, the local community so we've got an immediate local community in Ennerdell Bridge just not far from the upper valley where we are uh, just now and we've got a wider kind of coastal community as well so that advocacy and community support has been really critical it's critical to any project in land management when you're starting uh, otherwise you're um, kind of along a journey where it's not going to sustain itself over any length of time. So a lot of my job has been working with uh, individuals and different groups within um, the local immediate community and, and the coastal communities in West Cumbria. Um, and I think when you first start on a different journey for a valley, there's always going to be a little bit of caution and nervousness about something new. And it's not until you start implementing kind of practical work on the ground uh, that people can see what it actually means in in practice so that kind of transition from conifer dominated uh, forest to something much more uh, dynamic and diverse it's not until you start doing that on the ground that people have more of an understanding of what that actually means um, we have a, a wonderful volunteer team so that again that local advocacy is really important so around 20 volunteers all who live locally uh, come out regularly and that can be a whole range of different work right across the valley and it doesn't matter whose land they're working on whether it's National Trust or Forestry England uh, they're Wild Ennerdale uh, volunteers so that advocacy is important as well uh, and a much further further afield you know we have supporters regionally nationally and more so internationally too now which is which is fantastic so you need that buy-in uh, to a to a process and to sustain over a, over a long period of time so we're very much about thinking uh, that kind of future natural concept rather than trying to turn the clock back to a, a past landscape Rewilding a whole valley takes multi-decades. We're already 20 years into Wild Ennerdale and we would still say to people we are just beginning. And over that 20 years we've had multiple government policies, multiple uh, leaders of our organisations and some of the partners on the ground have changed as well. So it's really important that we think about advocacy. Advocacy in our own organisations, in organisations that have authority over what we do, say planning, and also organisations at a higher level that can have that broad impact on whether rewilding is seen as a positive thing or a negative thing. So what we do probably every, every couple of years is we look again at a sort of advocacy chart, people that we know who are in places of power but don't know much about what we're doing. People that uh, don't know much about what we're doing but are locally important to us. And we'll try and invite them to the valley and get them along and take time to introduce them to what we're doing and try and win their support through understanding so that when we're there in meetings that we can't attend, where they're thinking about policies that we're not involved in, hopefully Wild Endale will appear in those discussions and have a, an impact on the direction of travel of that particular policy, which will benefit us, but benefit other people around the country, because we want to see this type of uh, approach to nature conservation, to land management, and natural process-led approach much more widely, and that we're not the only people doing it. And that's starting to happen, which is really exciting. So I think one of the challenges we face as a partnership is about managing expectation. So when you're bringing in something new, sometimes particularly in a British kind of land management where we're used to working to quite small timescales. You might have a three-year plan or a five-year plan, 10-year plan if you're lucky, but we're very much about thinking long-term with Wild Ennerdale and there's no fixed endpoint, so it's more an evolving process towards implementing things on the ground. However, sometimes when you present an idea, uh, such as wanting to get Pine Martin back in the landscape, there could be an expectation that, okay, we need to 
to do that tomorrow or next week um, and often it takes much longer than that um, the habitat needs to be right there needs to be engagement support from uh, the local community and also it needs to be right for the species so we, we learned from pine martin that although they're finding their way into the the kind of northern area in in england from scotland that actually if we uh, kind of introduce them quite over, over a short period of time in twenadale they would quite quickly disperse and and disappear from out of this valley so that wasn't the right timing for pine martin equally we're looking at uh, beaver and again we would love to just pop beaver into Ennerdale next week the habitat's right uh, there's plenty of food source for them uh, the, that wide river corridor and the tributaries would be well suited to beaver we know where they would like to go however again there's a time kind of lead up to that and crucially part of that is is um, the community engagement and so we're working on that over the next year and that will form an important part of the licensing application another thing we've been careful to do uh, or not to do is to be too driven by funding so again it's that managing expectations if a pot of funding comes up um, you need to have a clear purpose of why you're applying for that funding so that you don't become funding driven so we're clear for an example with shifting away from spruce dominated uh, tree scape towards more, something much more diverse if funding can come in to help deliver that then that's fantastic and we, we are starting to kind of explore more routes for that but we won't be driven into a different way that diverts from the the vision or the the ethos of wild Ennerdale just because there's a pot of funding there another challenge in any long-term uh, partnership like this is things we don't control things we can't stop things we have very little influence about and one example here is a disease called Phytophthora morum, which impacts our larch trees. Now, larch trees are not native to England, but they are a very important part of many of our forests and landscapes across the country, especially here in the Lake District, where they change colour in autumn and they are lighter trees, they have vegetation growing under them than, say, our Sitka spruce. But unfortunately, this disease called Phytophthora morum that's been imported on horticultural products about uh, eight, nine years ago it came into this country on azaleas and rhododendrons and then jumped into larch. That's here and it's been here once before, um, about uh, eight, nine years ago we had it and we had to really make some challenging decisions about how do we deal with this because it was going to affect over 100 hectares of our forest. So we fell, had to fell some trees, uh, some trees we killed standing and they bring in different habitat, some trees we felled and it took away was extracted and sold, which gave us the opportunity to change that forest, introduce some new trees. But again, it, it went away, but it hits back again this year in 2021, and we're going we're gonna to lose some of the most special bits of larch forest we have. The welcome to Ennerdale this autumn is going to look quite different when we don't have the autumn colours. But what we try and do is look at these, these challenges and see if there are ways we can broaden the path that natural processes can operate on. Rather than taking one, one response to the challenge, can we do three or four responses that perhaps give different opportunities? We may not know what nature will do with these opportunities, these pathways, but if we offer nature multiple pathways, then hopefully natural processes have greater opportunity to be free to act. Uh, and that's one way we've really found in trying to deal with things we don't have any control of. What we do control is how we respond. One of our challenges has always been how we blur the boundaries between forests and farming, between growing trees and grazing animals. One of the ways we've done that is to re reintroduce cattle to the, to the valley and we've opened up the whole valley floor and the forest to their grazing, which has been great, works really well. They create special niches for seedlings to grow into, they break up the turf and they carry seedlings around, uh, the seeds around the valley up and down the hillside. But expanding native woodlands, which is our target, we want to see the valley go from 18% treed landscape to 40% treed landscape in maybe 50 years. That's not going to be easy when we've got sheep grazing as well. So we have reduced the intensity of sheep grazing and we've changed where that happens. But sheep grazing and farming with sheep is a very cultural part of the Lake District. So we have to balance these, these objectives. But that's always a challenge. We have a, a fence boundary right around the valley to try and keep sheep from coming into the areas that we want to regenerate. 
but rocks fall off the mountain uh, and the screes move and so the fence sometimes doesn't do its job and sheep get in and, and graze the trees we've just planted which is a real shame and that's just going to be an ongoing challenge for us and we've just got to keep looking out for those areas where the fence isn't working properly make repair it and then try and gather the sheep back up again but the cows are doing a great job of blurring those boundaries and actually through bringing cows into the valley we've expanded the farm business by 25 percent compared to before we started rewilding the valley which is a really good thing because it shows how farming forests and rewilding can work together so we hope you've enjoyed this exploration of the Ennerdale Valley and find some of the information that we've shared with you useful and also just got a sense of what a very special and beautiful place Ennerdale is in the Lake District and perhaps even it's inspired you to maybe visit one day uh, and experience Ennerdale for yourself. <laughs>